Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for uh, being at the White House uh, for the briefing today. Uh, I'm sure at least some of you are, are coming back from a, a late night trip to Mexico, which sounds a little more exciting than it probably was. Uh, but I appreciate you making the effort to be here. Keyword sounds. Uh, exactly. So uh, I don't have anything at the top, uh, but Julie, in the spirit of the Winter Olympic Games, I'll let you drop the buck here. Thank you. Um, can you walk us through what the theory is behind dropping chain CPI from the president's budget this year? Is this basically an acknowledgment that whatever hope there may have been, small though it may have been, that a grand bargain could be accomplished is now gone? Well, Julie, uh, uh, let me answer that in a couple of different ways. The first is, and it's important for you and your readers to understand that this is uh, this option, this offer from the president remains on the table. Uh, you'll recall that in the context of the discussions that we've been having with congressional Republicans about uh, reducing the deficit, uh, that the president put forward some specific ideas about how we can do that in a balanced way. Now, a balanced way means that the president put forward ideas that Republicans themselves support, things like changes to entitlement programs, and coupled them with some things that the president thinks would be good policy. Uh, things like closing tax loopholes uh, and using uh, revenue from those closed tax loopholes, uh, uh, savings from the entitlement changes that Republicans had sought, and use that to reduce the deficit. So the President was willing to step forward and put on the table a concrete proposal. Uh, unfortunately, Republicans uh, refused to even consider uh, the possibility of raising from revenue uh, by closing some loopholes that benefit only the wealthy and the well-connected. Uh, so that is an unfortunate policy choice that Republicans themselves have made. Uh, but the thing that's also important to understand is we've made substantial progress in reducing the deficit. There's more that we can do, and that's why the offer remains on the table. But over the last few years, the deficit in this country has reduced or has been, has been declining at the fastest rate since the end of World War II. And what the budget proposal will show when it's released in detail in a couple of weeks it will show that the deficit at the end of this 10-year window will be at less than 2 percent of GDP. Now, that sounds very technical, but I'm raising it for an important reason. You'll recall that when Democrats and Republicans agreed that we should work in bipartisan fashion and appoint the Simpson-Bowles Commission to examine proposals for reducing the deficit, the goal that was identified by Simpson-Bowles was to reduce the deficit as a percentage of GDP to below 3 percent. But what the, our budget projection shows is that by in the, over the course of the next 10 years, or in 10 years, the percentage will actually be below 2 percent. So we've made substantial progress in reducing the deficit. We welcome opportunities uh, uh, to cooperate further and reduce the deficit further with Republicans. But the President also believes it's important that we start spending some time uh, uh, focusing on what kinds of policies we can put in place that will expand the economic opportunity for every American. But I guess even though chain CPI remains on the table sort mm -hmm. of in a theoretical way, including it in the budget, has been seen as sort of a good faith gesture to Republicans. Mm -hmm. So I'm just trying to understand, is this, by not including it this year, is this just a signal that you don't see the possibility of sort of opening larger budget negotiations with the Republicans this year? Well, again, that will that will have to be up to Republicans. But, in, in but doesn't this signal that the White House really doesn't see that as possible? <coughs> Otherwise, why wouldn't you just put it in the budget? Not, well, there, and the reason for that is, uh, there's actually a good reason for that, so let me get to that, which is that traditionally what budget proposals from presidents and either party have been is they have been a specific, tangible proposal from the administration about how the president in an ideal world believes that the government should be funded. Now, what we've seen over the last several months is a return to a welcome return to regular order. We saw Democrats and Republicans on Capitol Hill get together, broker a budget agreement uh, in which both sides had to compromise. Neither side got everything, every single thing that they wanted. Uh, but we saw uh, that piece of legislation passed with bipartisan majorities. And so the budget proposal that the President is going to put forward will reflect the spending levels that were agreed to by Ryan and Murray, uh, that the President is going to live within that compromise and will have a specific proposal for how we can, uh, how we can do that. So this is really the budget submission that you'll see from the president is really a return to regular order. Last year's was, uh, was a little bit different, that the president presented a unique uh, budget offering to reflect the circumstances. There was a, a point in time when there was a little bit more optimism about the willingness of Republicans to budge on, um, 
closing some tax loopholes. But over the course of the last year, they've refused to do that. So uh, with this return to regular order uh, in Congress, we're seeing a return to regular order in terms of the President's budget offering, but it does not reflect any uh, reduction in the President's willingness to try to meet Republicans uh, in the middle uh, and find a balanced way to reduce our deficit even further than we already have. Okay, and on a separate topic, the EU looks like they've decided to impose sanctions on officials in the Ukraine who they say are responsible for this violence. Does the U.S. plan to follow with sanctions of its own? Uh, I've seen those reports. I, it's unclear to me whether or not EU officials have actually confirmed those reports yet. Uh, some EU officials have. Some EUs have? Okay. Um, or some EU officials have. Uh, I'm not in a position to confirm any additional steps uh, that the United States has decided to take at this point. Uh, the President uh, and other senior members of this administration alluded yesterday to the fact that there were a range of tools that could be used by the administration to uh, hold accountable those who have either ordered or are responsible for the violence that's being perpetrated by the Ukrainian government against peaceful protesters. So there are a range of options that are available, uh, and I, uh, it is fair to say that a range of options is being actively considered at the White House. But I don't have any specific things, uh, any specific decisions about those options to relate to you now. Uh, as soon as some decisions have been made, uh, if they are made, we'll let you know. Okay? Can I'll skip around a little bit. Apparently a statement has come out by the EU. And confirming, and I can read a piece of it if you want. Okay. Uh, I wasn't doubting the report, so I'm not surprised to hear that they've, they've made this decision. We, we certainly are in close co uh, consultation with our EU allies uh, on a range of topics, but particularly uh, the situation in Ukraine. Um, and timing on when, when a decision will be made by uh, the U.S. on? I, I can't offer you any insight into that right now, uh, other than to say that there are a range of options that are available to the President. Uh, he is actively considering those range of options, and as soon as uh, there's a decision to announce. Uh, we'll make sure that you uh, and your colleagues are among the first to know. Sorry. Okay, that's okay. So, Roberta. So yesterday when the President said um, that there will be consequences if people step over the line, has that line been crossed in the renewed violence this morning? Or can you explain a little bit more about what that line is and what that meant? Well, I think the President was trying to make a couple of points when he said that. The first is that there is that the government in, in Ukraine has a responsibility, has the primary responsibility for making sure that uh, the violence that we've seen does not continue. <coughs> now, that doesn't absolve protesters of their responsibility to exercise their right to peaceful protest uh, in a peaceful manner, but uh, the, the, the government of Ukraine has a unique responsibility uh, to, um, to allow and to protect the, the rights of assembly and peaceful protest uh, and freedom of speech that the Ukrainian people are seeking to exercise. Um, the President also was making clear that there are options available to the United States and to the international community and to our allies, including those in the EU, to hold accountable those who, um, who perpetrate violence uh, against peaceful protesters. So, um, you know, the options here are, um, are before us. Uh, some of our allies are starting to make some decisions about them. This is something that we are actively considering here at the White House. Uh, but uh, at this point, I don't have any specific decisions to, uh, to share with you. Um, if I might ask on Keystone. You may. Um, given the Nebraska court decision yesterday, will the administration put a pause on the national interest determination process that's underway right now? Uh, Roberta, as you've heard uh, me and others say many times, that this is a process that currently is being run by the State Department. So if you have questions about the impact that external factors uh, might have on that process, then you should direct those questions to the State Department. But how can the administration possibly continue this process, given that the route through Nebraska is somewhat uncertain, given yesterday's court decision? Uh, again, I haven't reviewed the court decision myself. Uh, I've, seen, I've certainly seen the reports of it. Um, the, the, uh, but the impact of a court decision and ongoing litigation, uh, you know, what impact that might have on the ongoing process is something that I can't say uh, from here because this is a process that's being run by the State Department. So the White House that's isn't the reviewing that. The White House isn't reviewing the impact. Uh, no, this, the State Department is reviewing this process. They've been in charge of this process for right, for the White quite House some time. Isn't now. reviewing the impact of that court decision on the process. Uh, again, this is a State Department process, so the State Department will be the ones will be the 
the, the officials to evaluate uh, what impact uh, ongoing litigation may have on their process. Okay. All right. Jen. Thanks, Josh. Uh, Obama met with African American civil rights leaders yesterday. Did they talk about Michael Boggs at Tuesday. all? Mm -hmm. the, the Georgia judicial nominee? Um, he, the, the president met with a, a group of civil rights leaders a couple of days ago. I think it was on Tuesday. Um, I, I haven't seen a, I think there is a blog post available at whitehouse.gov about the conversation uh, that the president had uh, with those leaders. I know they talked about uh, the Affordable Care Act and the importance of uh, communicating to the American public uh, and particularly to uh, individuals in the African American community about the potential benefits that are available to them uh, at healthcare.gov. Uh, and some of the protections that are now in place for consumers because of the Affordable Care Act. I know they had a number of conversations, or they had a conversation about uh, some of the ideas related to criminal justice reform that the President and the Attorney General have both discussed. Uh, but in terms of specifics, I can't uh, go beyond that uh, in terms of whether or not a specific judicial nominee came up or not. Okay. Um, well, on that note, so no, there's now more than two dozen progressive groups, including NARAL, Pro Choice America, the Human Rights Campaign, Move On, and the National Organization for Women that are all calling on Obama to pull down Boggs' nomination because they say they're really upset about votes he took as a state legislator on abortion rights, gay rights, and civil rights. They want him to nominate somebody else. Do you think that Obama would consider putting forward somebody else if the pressure from his own base kept at this level? Uh, Jen, I haven't seen the statements from, from the groups that you've mentioned. I'll, I'll see if we can collect some more information and get back to you with a specific reaction. Josh, okay. Jim, I'll get to you. Can we get to, uh, back to Ukraine, if we could? What, what do you tell the, the American people, the person sitting in their lounge chair watching this terrible violence, about why, what strategic interest the United States has in getting involved in this protest? Mm -hmm. what, what is the strategic interest of the United States? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I think there are a couple of things. I think that the, uh, that the American people, I think, are justifiably concerned, certainly the President is, when we see the basic human rights uh, of anybody around the globe being so flagrantly trampled. Uh, that is, that has certainly been part of the situation that appears to be underway uh, in Ukraine. And that is the source of, uh, of great concern here at the White House. The other concern that we have is uh, the desire, and I guess it's a related concern, for countries to have governments that reflect the will and aspirations of their people. And what we have seen is an attempt uh, by the Ukrainian regime to stifle dissent uh, in their country. And that so much of the turmoil that's ongoing there is related to the desire of the Ar Ukrainian people to have a government and a leadership that reflects their will and their preferences. So what the President has been encouraging is uh, for the violence to come to an immediate end and for the government and the opposition to sit down at the table and uh, try to reach a diplomatic solution to this disagreement uh, that would include a unity government that would allow the, uh, the, the country of Ukraine to be integrated into the international community uh, and to have uh, solid relationships with their neighbors, but also to have solid relationships with countries all around, uh, all around the world. And that's the, that is the, our longer term goal here. But uh, you know, any time that we see that there is this kind of turmoil that has resulted in uh, some basic civil rights being violated uh, is a source of some concern. For the, as far as the national security of the United States, is there anything that's happening in that, in that uh, square in Kiev mm -hmm. that really impacts the United States? Mm -hmm. Well, I think this is something that we're monitoring, right? That this is something that uh, has aroused a lot of concern because, uh, again, you know, as a, as a freedom-loving country and a freedom-loving people, uh, it is the subject of significant concern when uh, the, uh, the rights of peaceful protesters who are trying to exercise their right of peaceful assembly, who are trying to exercise their right to express their uh, disagreement with political decisions, uh, having those rights being trampled uh, is the source of some concern. And that's why the President is considering uh, options like sanctions. That's why the State Department uh, uh, announced the decision that they made yesterday to uh, put a visa ban in place for government officials in Ukraine who are who have been judged to be accountable for uh, some of the violence that's taken place there. So there is a, uh, this is the subject of some concern, and it's why the President's considering a range of options that are available to him. And how much is the bigger picture of the United States and Russia, quote unquote, spheres of influence, mm -hmm. 
going back at echoes of a Cold War. Yeah. How much of that is, is a concern to, them, to the White House? Well, the President talked about this a little bit at the news conference yesterday, that this idea of spheres of influence is, uh, is a pretty outdated notion. That what we're, what we're seeing in Ukraine is, is a frustration on the part of the population that their government, that their elected representatives, are not reflecting their aspirations, and that we're starting to see uh, a rolling back in some of the basic democratic institutions in that country, and that the, it is clear that uh, at least some of the uh, human rights, basic human rights that we uh, hold so dear in this country, uh, are not being respected in that country. And uh, that's the source of uh, quite a bit of concern. And uh, but it is not necessarily related to uh, any effort by um, former Cold War adversaries to try to gain a foothold in one country or another. This shouldn't be a zero-sum game. Uh, this should be uh, – it's, it's in the interest of the international community for peace uh, and stability to be restored in Ukraine, and that's what we're striving toward. Uh, it's the view of the President, it's the view of this administration, that that stability and peace will only be achieved uh, through conversations and through talks and through a willingness of both the government and the opposition to sit across the table and try to find some solutions, this situation will not be resolved through violence. Well, okay. Josh. Joe. We're over a month out from the ACA <coughs> sign-up deadline, and it's beginning to sound like you're not going to reach that seven million uh, goal. The vice president said five or six million, the CBO said six million. What's the number if you know it? And if you don't get to five million, uh, is the ACA in trouble? Well, uh, you've cited some of the bad news there, Joe, and I recognize that that's part of your job. Uh, there was also some good news yesterday that if you look at uh, the state of California, uh, they announced yesterday that they'd already exceeded the projections uh, that they had made for the number of signups they're hoping for this year, uh, despite the fact that there are uh, there are another six weeks left in the sign-up period. So there are some states, some local exchanges that are ahead of the curve when it comes to signing people up and exceeding their projections. Now that, that indicates a couple of things. One, it indicates that the uh, health care website that was the subject of so much consternation and frustration both from this administration but also from people across the country who are trying to use it, that a lot of those problems have been resolved and that we have a website that's functioning pretty well. The second thing it indicates is that that functioning website is presenting options to people who visit it that are attractive, that people are looking on that website, finding that there are health care options that previously weren't available to their family, that these are uh, health care offerings that are of a higher quality and a lower cost than was previously available. They're taking advantage of that opportunity by signing up, and that's why we're seeing uh, those strong numbers. So uh, there is some good news out there, and we're, we're pleased to see it. Uh, ultimately, what our goal is, uh, particularly uh, the goal that we're focused on over the course of the next six weeks is to sign up as many people as possible, to educate people about the options that are available to them uh, and let them know that there's an opportunity for them to sign up. Is coming in lower than seven million a problem for you, though? Uh, I mean, either in terms of optics or uh, in terms of, uh, you know, fundamentals. Is it a problem to be at five million? Is it a problem to be at six million? Well, the, the fundamentals actually are determined by the kind of, of of mix of the population that's incorporated into the exchange. Uh, but again, we're not really focused on the optics. What we're focused on is making sure that every single American can enjoy the benefits of this important law. If you are one of uh, the vast majority of Americans that already has health insurance, this law only affects that health insurance by adding additional protections to you to make sure that you can't be discriminated against if you have a pre-existing condition, uh, if it will help you uh, in some cases for seniors allow, make their prescription drug costs a little lower. Um, but if you are uh, in that group of Americans that has to purchase health insurance on your own or you don't currently have health insurance, thanks to the Affordable Care Act, for the first time there now are some high quality affordable options that are available to you. Uh, and that's the message that we're focused on delivering over the course of the next five to six and, weeks. And quickly, just sort of a political question. The CBO has uh, come out with some stuff recently that has caused a bit of heartburn among Democrats, including uh, these latest numbers, as well as uh, the stuff on the minimum wage earlier this week. How are you going to um, sort of uh, get through to the American public when they're seeing this 30-second spot that no longer no doubt is going to, to hit the airwaves sooner or later. It says uh, the administration uh, has some real problems with some of its key issues. Mm -hmm. 
Well, uh, in terms of how people are going to choose to respond to individual um, attack ads, I mean, uh, attack ads that are directed at the, at a, at the president who's not facing re-election is, um, I guess, money I'd welcome our opponents to spend if they chose to do so. Uh, I assume that some of them will be uh, maybe directing those attack ads at individual members of Congress who are on the ballot. Uh, I would leave it to them, to, this, to those individual members of Congress, to decide how they would want to respond to them. But there is no doubt that there is a strong, persuasive case that Democrats across the country can make about this party, this president, and individual members of Congress laser-like focus on expanding economic opportunity for the middle class. That is uh, something that the minimum wage would do. Raising the minimum wage would ensure that hard work uh, can lead to a decent living. That you don't, that if you're working 40 hours a week and you're making the minimum wage, you shouldn't have to raise your family of four below the poverty line. Uh, so raising the minimum wage, that's one reason that I think you see strong support all across the country for raising the minimum wage, just about everywhere except uh, among the Republican uh, House and the Republican Senate, unfortunately. Uh, but when it comes to the Affordable Care Act, there's a strong case to be made uh, about, the, about the security that is um, now available to individual middle class families and small business owners, that uh, their health care costs will uh, be lower, or at least the growth in those health care costs uh, will not be at the same rate it was before. Uh, and that many people, particularly those who didn't previously have health insurance, now have quality options available to them so they, never, they no longer have to go to sleep at night wondering if their family is one illness away from bankruptcy. CBO is not a problem for you lately. Well, look, I mean, if, when it comes to the CBO, the CBO has an important role to play, that they are the nonpartisan arbiter to evaluate uh, what impact different proposals might have uh, on the budget, uh, or on you know, the broader economy. Um, but the fact of the matter is, a lot of the things that the CBO found, uh, particularly when it comes to the minimum wage report that you mentioned, uh, are reasons to be strongly supportive of raising the minimum wage. They found that, would, that it would uh, take uh, millions of families all across the country out of poverty, that it would raise the salary of millions, millions of other families, those who currently make below minimum wage or currently uh, you know, less than $10.10 an hour, but also would raise the wages of those who make just a little more than $10.10 an hour. And the resulting positive impact on the broader economy uh, would have uh, uh, strong benefits um, for communities all across the country. So uh, in that CBO report that was the subject of some uh, discussion, shall we say, earlier this week, there was plenty of evidence that was presented by the independent CBO, the nonpartisan CBO, to indicate that raising the minimum wage would have really good economic benefits. So let's move around a little bit. Mara? Um, can you tell us what the message is tonight from the president to the Democratic governors and how that would differ from what he tells all the governors on Monday? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I don't have any specific marks from the president to preview tonight, so I'd encourage you to tune in and, and hear what he has to say. But that's going to be, we can't, we can't yeah. do that. Uh, there will be a, that's right. So you'll be oh. able to. Uh, Afterwards, uh, we can't tune in. Uh, right, not exactly. literally tune in, oh, but okay. figuratively tune in to your email uh, and read the pool report and the transcript that we'll issue. Uh, but, uh, you know, over the course of the next several days, the president will have the opportunity to meet with governors uh, who are in town for the National Governors Association meeting uh, in Washington, D.C. So the president on Friday will be meeting uh, tomorrow, it's Friday. The president will be meeting with some Democratic governors to talk about uh, a range of issues. Um, the, over the weekend, the president will hold his traditional uh, formal dinner for the, the governors and their wives who are in town. Uh, and then, as you point out, Mara, on Monday, the president will be speaking to a bipartisan group of, of governors here at the White House. So the president is looking forward to the opportunity to talking to this bipartisan group of governors uh, about a range of proposals that the president himself uh, has been urging Congress to act on. Uh, I think what you'll find is that there is strong bipartisan support among the group of governors for some of the proposals that the President's advocating that are currently being blocked by Republicans in Congress. That from raising the minimum wage to investing in early childhood education to uh, reforming our job training programs, those are the kinds of proposals that governors, uh, Republican governors all across the country uh, are supportive of in their states. So there's no reason that uh, Republican members of Congress uh, shouldn't be willing to sit down with the president and try and make progress in some of these areas. So um, I don't want to preview exactly what the president's message will be uh, to those governors, but uh, I would encourage you, you'll get the chance to hear what the president has to say to them, uh, and um, it should be interesting. But, but, but do you anticipate these remarks to be pretty much identical, what he's going to tell the Democrats and what he's going to tell the big NGA? Uh, I mean, I, I think that there will be a lot of overlap. I, again, I don't want to predict 
Um, two different, you're asking me to sort of predict two different sets of remarks the President has delivered yet. Uh, but I think that the message that the President wants to uh, convey to those, uh, to those governors about his commitment to expanding economic opportunity for every single American in this country uh, <coughs> and the ideas that he's presented uh, related to uh, funding for early childhood education, to funding for infrastructure projects that would uh, create jobs in the short term and strengthen the economy over the long term, <coughs> that uh, reforming job training programs, investments in clean energy, uh, are all the kinds of ideas that should have appeal to both Democratic and Republican governors. Uh, unfortunately, they don't, for some reason, uh, don't seem to have much appeal among Republican members of Congress, uh, but we're going to try to change that. So, Major. What's the sense of urgency on sanctions with Ukraine? What's the timeline? Well, uh, I can't give you a specific timeline, but given the, given the, the violence that we saw overnight in Ukraine, I think uh, it's fair to say that the options available to the President are being considered with some urgency. Why does the administration believe sanctions would, uh, would help and not punish some of the very citizens of Ukraine that the United States theoretically would like to help? Well, uh, unintended consequences uh, of the sort that you have highlighted here are one of the reasons that, the, uh, that these kinds of things are under consideration, that, uh, you know, that making a decision about sanctions is, it can't just be a knee-jerk reaction. It's important for us to consider the range of consequences uh, that could ensue from uh, applying some sanctions. So, but uh, again, we're, w there is a sense of urgency that is being felt because of the terrible violence that we saw uh, overnight. Fair to say that you're looking at maybe granular sanctions that might focus on the, those wealthiest in Ukraine who have assets inside and outside the country that have also been supportive of the Yanukovych government. Uh, I, w I don't want to speculate about what uh, about what the end result might be or what specific options the president is considering. Uh, there is a full uh, a full toolkit. I think someone described it as yesterday, as yesterday. and uh, that's what uh, you know, the president is, is taking a look at that entire toolkit. Uh, and we'll make some decisions uh, based on um, uh, uh, on the kinds of policies that would have the maximum effect. Uh, and again, w the result that we're trying to get to here uh, is an end to the violence on both sides uh, and uh, conversations between the opposition and the government uh, about, pol about a unity government that could be formed, about a technical government. Uh, that would reflect the will and aspirations of the Ukrainian people. Speaking of those potential conversations, there are reports this morning that Vladimir Putin wants to send an envoy to Ukraine to participate in talks between the opposition and the Yanukovych government. How would the administration look upon that, favorably or unfavorably? Well, I don't have a specific reaction in terms of personnel that may be uh, sent from the Putin administration to Ukraine, but suffice it to say that uh, the United States and Russia do share a common interest. Uh, in peace and stability in Ukraine. Uh, that is certainly what the uh, Obama administration is advocating for. Uh, and because it's in the clear interest of, uh, of the Russians, we uh, are hopeful that that's what, uh, that, uh, that Putin and- would not view that as meddlesome? Um, again, I, I wouldn't have anything to say specifically about uh, an individual, an emissary from the Putin administration heading to Ukraine. Uh, but suffice it to say that there is a, uh, that there is shared interest uh, on the part of not just of Russia and the United States, but countries all around the world uh, for peace and stability to be restored in Ukraine. Okay. John Christopher. Jay, uh, Josh, excuse me. Um, it's okay. It's okay. I could never miss I've been called worse. <laughs> we'll leave it at that. Um, needless to say, things have gone from worse to worse. And there are 45 million Ukrainians affected, not only in Kiev, but in other major cities across the country. How? How, how does it complicate things that uh, it's been reported that the protesters now have, uh, have taken 67 police officers as prisoners and that they will not back down until Yanukovych has resigned? Mm -hmm. this, there is no question that what we're looking at here is a chaotic and violent situation. And trying to get to the bottom of, of individual actions that have taken place all across the country uh, is very difficult. Uh, but we've been very clear for quite some time now that the uh, Yanukovych government has the primary responsibility to ensure that violence does not occur uh, or to bring violence to an end when it does. And uh, that is uh, uh, a responsibility that they should take seriously. And they need to exercise uh, the, ex the authority and control that they have to bring that violence to an end. 
There's also a responsibility on the part of protesters to make sure that they're expressing their concerns and expressing their right to peaceful assembly uh, in a peaceful way. But it, but it, it looks like it's no longer peaceful, Josh. Uh, no, uh, that's, that's evident the from the reports. The, 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 the that there footage is, is unbelievable. Yeah, I mean, again, there's there's Molotov cocktails, et cetera, burning. That there is chaos and violence there that is of uh, significant concern to this administration. We are calling on all sides to end the violence. Uh, we do need to get to a place where we can have uh, constructive talks between the opposition uh, and the government. Uh, while those talks are ongoing, the violence should, should uh, be put to rest. And, um, you know, and that is, that's, what we're, that's what this administration is working to do, from you know, the Vice President's repeated calls to, to President Yanukovych, to senior members of the State Department who have traveled to Ukraine in recent weeks, to our diplomatic staff in Ukraine right now uh, that is putting themselves in harm's way to try to bring an end to the violence. Can so, you give us any insight as to some of the conversation the President may have had with some of the leaders in, uh, in NATO, for example? Uh, I'm not in a position to do that right now. Um, I, I wouldn't rule out that the President may have some conversations later today with some of our allies around the world that do have uh, a vested interest in peace and stability in Ukraine. Uh, if we're in a position to read out those calls later today, uh, we'll do that. Thank you, Josh. Okay. Luke. Welcome to the briefing room, buddy. Thank you. It's back up quarterback day. Uh, there you go. Um, you talk about chain CPI still being on the table. Where's the onus to go to the table? Is it on the Speaker or the White House? Well, considering that the White House has put forward a very specific, tangible, formal offer that was uh, included in, the, in last year's budget proposal, uh, there's an opportunity for Republicans to respond to that proposal. That includes um, the balanced approach that the President has advocated. We have not seen that from Republicans so far. Uh, it seems to me that, based on common sense, that uh, Republicans have the opportunity to advance those discussions if they choose to do so. If they choose not to do so, that's up to them uh, as well, too. They say you guys refuse to negotiate. <laughs> well, uh, the first step in negotiating is put forward a specific, tangible, compromise proposal. Uh, and that's what the President did in December of 2012. And here we are in February of 2014, uh, still waiting for a constructive, specific, formal proposal from Republicans uh, that, again, acknowledges the spirit of what the President offered. And it's important for people to understand that the President, this would be a little more legitimate criticism if the President were just put, putting forward the ideas that he supports and told the Republicans to take it or leave it. But what the President did was very different than that. What the President put forward was uh, a series of proposals that led with ideas that Republicans themselves advocate. Uh, changes to entitlement programs is something that Republicans uh, in Congress uh, ran for office on uh, and have ad had been aggressively advocating. The President, in a sign of his willingness to compromise, uh, included those entitlement changes into the formal offer and coupled them with some things that the President would like to see done in, in the form of uh, closing loopholes that benefit the wealthy and the well-connected, tax loopholes that benefit the wealthy and the well-connected. We haven't seen a, a willingness from Republicans to do anything uh, other than just try to accept the things they've already said they support. That's not the kind of spirit and compromise that's going to lead to uh, the kind of solution that they say they would like to see. With the debt limit, though, pushed until next year and the budget figured out until later in the year, probably not going to come up as a midterm issue, do you foresee large-scale deficit reduction talks in 2014? Well, again, I, th those, are, those are talks the President is willing to engage in. But I think it would be fair for you to say that the, that the President's focus, uh, while that offer remains on the table, uh, is squarely upon ideas that he has and ideas that are supported by, as I mentioned, Republican governors across the country, uh, to, uh, uh, to expand economic opportunity for the middle class. That, that there are a range of ideas related to clean energy, uh, infrastructure, research and development, uh, early childhood education that, uh, you know, that the President is focused on, that the President has a, you know, will have, as, um, uh, as was reported earlier today, some specific ideas for how we can make those kinds of investments that are so critical to our economy and do that in a fiscally responsible way. So even if Republicans don't want to sit down at the table and try to reach a, a broader agreement that would result solely in deficit reduction, maybe they'll be willing to sit down across the table from the President and have a conversation about policies that people on both sides of the aisle say would be good for our economy and, most importantly, good for middle class families. One of those issues is immigration reform. Mm -hmm. Would the White House support House Democrats filing a discharge petition on the Senate immigration bill in the House? That's a good question. I don't think that we've taken a position on the specific 
uh, on a specific discharge, discharge, discharge petition. If we have, I'll get back to you on that. Uh, what we have said is that, uh, that there is an opportunity for, now that, we've, now that there has been a bipartisan compromise passed through the Senate, uh, the process now rests with the House. Uh, and the President and this administration have, have committed to taking a step back uh, and giving House Republicans the opportunity to consider a range of proposals. There were some principles that, uh, that leaked out from a, a Republican meeting a couple of weeks ago for how to move forward on, on immigration reform. So we're going to give uh, House Republicans the opportunity to, uh, to have some conversations among themselves. We're hopeful that they will make a decision to act in a bipartisan way. That's what we saw uh, in the Senate. And if we get that same kind of bipartisan spirit moving in the House, then I'm confident that, um, that we could move pretty quickly to resolve something that both parties acknowledge needs but to be fixed. Real quick, if you guys put your muscle behind a discharge petition, all you need is around 28 Republicans. You saw they came around for the debt limit increase. Why not move on that? Are you worried about losing immigration as an issue ahead of the midterms? Uh, no. I think what the President's worried about is finally reforming a broken immigration system, that if we put in place the comprehensive, common sense, bipartisan compromise that Republican senators voted for, that we would strengthen the economy, we'd create jobs, we'd expand economic growth, and we'd reduce the deficit. So there are a whole lot of reasons why implementing Im immigration reform along the lines of the bipartisan compromise that was reached by the Senate would be good for the economy. Uh, that's what the President's focused on. The, the politics in the elections will, will take care of themselves. Uh, and they can take care of themselves, frankly, in a number of ways. I think um, many Republicans, uh, who know much more about Republican politics than I do, have spoken to the danger of, of Republican members of Congress continuing to oppose uh, bipartisan immigration reform. Ed. Josh, back on Ukraine, I just wanted to ask, when you were talking about the full toolkit, is this just a conversation about sanctions, or is a U.S. military option on the table like it is for other crises like Syria? Is this a different situation, or is a military option on the table? Uh, right now, the thing that's, the, when I talked about options that are under active consideration right now, we're talking about sanctions. Okay. And CNN specifically reported earlier today that the sanction, potential U.S. sanctions have been, quote, unquote, fast-tracked and that they're actually already here, ready for the President's signature, obviously waiting to see whether he, he'll decide. When you say urgency, has it been fast-tracked? Is it sitting here at the White House, ready to go? Well, I don't want to get into the sort of behind-the-scenes details of this process, but <laughs> understandably so. Um, but suffice it to say that the, the President and his uh, senior members of his team have been acting uh, quickly to consider the range of options that are available. Uh, and acting with a sense of urgency because of the terrible violence that we saw overnight. And uh, as soon as we have a decision to announce on, uh, on which of those options um, uh, make the most sense and would produce, uh, are most likely to produce the uh, intended result, uh, then we'll let you know if uh, that decision was oh, made. Uh, you today and the President last night at the news conference sort of downplayed that this is a Cold War kind of back and forth with Putin. Wall Street Journal on its front page today reports, quote, the Obama administration has found itself repeatedly caught off guard by Putin's moves in places like Syria, Iran, Egypt, and even NSA leaker Edward Snowden. Is there a frustration here at the White House that there is at least a perception around the world that Putin is in, in control over the president on some of these issues? Mm -hmm. I'm not sure that's the prevailing sentiment around the globe. It might, might be the prevailing sentiment in the Wall Street Journal editorial. Hey, this is uh, a one-page news story. Okay. Okay. Um, well, again, if you take a look at the, uh, some of the examples that you've cited, there is a, um, there's a lot of common ground between the United States and Russia that could be um, staked out. That, again, there is, it is not in Russia's interest and it's not in the world's interest for there to be this continued violence and instability uh, in Ukraine. Uh, it is not in uh, Russia's interest, I think as they have themselves have said, for their client state, uh, Syria, to be uh, coming apart at the seams based on some sectarian tensions. Right, but you so, made that case, like the President's made that case directly to Putin, and right. he doesn't seem to be listening. So isn't there a perception that he's, well, he, you've made that case on Syria again and again, have. client state, and he doesn't listen. We have. But I, I, guess my, I guess the point I'm trying to make here is it's not as if um, uh, Mr. Putin has his feet up on his desk uh, sighing with relief about the current situation in either Ukraine or Syria right now. Uh, the fact of the matter is, it is, it is not in Russia's interest for there to be this continuing sectarian violence that is threatening to pull apart this client state, the only client state that, that Russia has in the Middle East right now. So uh, 
I guess this highlights something that the President alluded to in his comments yesterday, that resolutions to these uh, terrible situations are not a zero-sum game that trying to bring peace and stability, or at least to get both sides to put down arms and sit across the negotiating table from one another, to try to put in place governments that are actually representative of, of the will of the people, uh, are in the broader global interest. Uh, and that there is nothing for the United States to gain at the expense of Russia for some of these changes to start happening. Uh, in fact, the, the perpetuation of this violence, uh, you know, frankly, runs counter to the uh, national interest of the United States. And I, I, I assume, and I, I think it stands to reason, uh, that President Putin would think the same thing uh, about Russians' interest in these situations. A uh, quick last one. Uh, several Republicans on Capitol Hill have expressed outrage about an FCC proposal to put monitors into newsrooms. Is there a White House position on that? Mm, I, I haven't seen that report yet. I'll have to take a look at that. Okay. Carol. You guys have repeatedly said that you're not going to preview the president's budget, and yet today you're coming out with not only specific details of his budget, but also a general theme on how he's approaching his budget. Why are you doing that now? Well, I um, a couple of I, I guess a couple of reasons. There's been a lot of interest in uh, trying to understand uh, what the president's approach will be in putting forward his budget. That budgets traditionally have been a um, an opportunity for an administration to lay out, uh, uh, um, you know, its principles, its priorities when it comes to funding the government. Uh, you know, you've heard people in both parties talk about how budgets are basically nothing more than an articulation of one party's or one individual's priorities, uh, that budgets are about priorities. And so, uh, given all of the interest and attention uh, on um, on the President's priorities of the last couple of weeks, particularly in the aftermath of the, the State of the Union, um, it makes sense that uh, I try to explain to you uh, what those priorities are based on uh, uh, an Associated Press report today. Is there a um, message that you're trying to send at this particular time to Republicans? Um, no. I, well, not, at least not a message that's any different than the message that the President delivered in his State of the Union address that the focal point of this President's domestic policymaking agenda is expanding economic opportunity for the middle class, and that he is going to leave no stone unturned in his search for, uh, for policies that will strengthen uh, the likelihood that economic opportunity will be expanded in this country, and the President will leave no stone untoned, unturned in his search for uh, individuals on the other side of the aisle who are willing to work with him to uh, achieve that agenda. Uh, but the President has also been clear that he's not just going to wait for uh, those individuals on the other side of the aisle to materialize. Well, they say uh, that he's throwing in the towel, that that's what this budget is. Well, uh, I'm not sure in which context they mean. Meaning that it, he's <coughs> not looking to negotiate, that he's, like you said, setting out his own priorities and is going to go out and champion his own priorities and not trying to convene yeah. some kind of large Was that somebody from the Speaker's office, office who, who said that? Is, I, I guess. Did you, did you point out to them in that conversation that it was their boss who said that they were done negotiating with the President? No, I'm asking you. Yeah, yeah I, 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 I I'm just, you, I'm, not, I'm not critiquing your journalism school skills here. I'm just sort of pointing out that it's, uh, it's slightly ironic for somebody who has uh, resolutely declared on national television that they're no longer negotiating with the President to criticize the President for refusing to negotiate. The fact of the matter is, is the President is articulating very clearly what his principles are. They are encapsulated in his budget. and. Uh, you know, you and all the Republicans on Capitol Hill will have the opportunity to pour over the details of that budget when we release the tables in a couple of weeks. So are you, does he, just to get back to what he plans to do with them then, if mm -hmm. he's not going to convene some negotiations around what he's proposing, is he going to take the road and try to sell these things to the public? Is there mm -hmm. a different approach he's going to be taking in that respect? Well, I think you can continue to see, you can expect that you, uh, that the President will continue to do what he's done the last several weeks which is to lay out very clearly what his principles are, what his priorities are when it comes to putting in place policies that will expand economic opportunity for the middle class. Uh, the President will go on the road and talk about what those priorities are. Uh, he will urge Congress to act on them. And he will demonstrate his willingness uh, to act where Congress doesn't. Uh, it doesn't mean that, his, um, that he's given up on Congress at all, but it does mean uh, that he is not going to um, allow congressional in inaction 
uh, to prevent progress in Washington, D.C. on a set of priorities that the President thinks uh, are critical to the long-term success of this country. Okay. Vikera. Thank you, sir. So spheres of influence and chessboard, Cold War chessboards notwithstanding, it's obviously Russia is a big player in Ukraine and in this crisis. Mm -hmm. And to a large degree, it's an adversarial relationship with the United States, especially over this back and forth over the last several weeks, culminating in the President's comments last night about Vladimir Putin. So why doesn't the President pick up the phone and call Vladimir Putin and try to come to some sort of agreement as, you, as Kiev burns? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, the President tried to make this point last night, and I will not do it as eloquently as he did, but I'm going to give it a shot anyway, as long as I'm standing up here. Um, the fact of the matter is the dispute that is ongoing in Ukraine now, as tragic and as violent as it is now, is not the result of differing perspectives in Ukraine between the United States and Russia. That may have been true in the 70s and 80s, uh, but it's not true today. That the, that the turmoil that we're seeing in Ukraine is directly related to the aspirations of the Ukrainian people and their sense that their government is not doing a good job of representing uh, their wishes and their aspirations. Uh, and you have people in Ukraine who are not um, focused on whether or not the United States would benefit from one uh, decision of the U U uh, Yanukovych administration. They're focused on whether or not the Ukrainian people benefit from a decision or two that is made by the U Yanukovych administration. So the focus on this situation um, shouldn't be on this outdated notion of spheres of influence. It should be focused on a peaceful resolution uh, of the concerns of the, of the Ukrainian people. Yeah, but there are, I mean, it's essentially an east-west divide that triggered this, right? The EU uh, versus Moscow and Yanukovych's decision to go to Moscow for loan guarantees. Mm -hmm. So is there, as the President uh, looks over this range of options on sanctions, is there a concern that sanctions might have the opposite of the intended effect and draw, dr drive Yanukovych further into the arms of Russia? Well, uh, I'll say a couple things about that. The first is, and Major sort of asked a version of this question earlier, which is that we do have a, we are carefully considering what our options are when it comes to sanctions uh, because there are a range of, of consequences, some intended and some not. So we're going to carefully consider the options uh, that are available and if, if and when a decision is made, we'll make a, an announcement about those. But, um, you know, our concern does not, uh, our, our principal concern here does not, bless you, Mara, our principal concern here does not lie in whether or not uh, Vladimir Putin stands to gain or lose from the ongoing conflict in Ukraine. Our principal concern is making sure that violence in Ukraine comes to an end, that the opposition and the government sit down at the negotiating table uh, and reach uh, an agreement to move forward in a way that will unify the government uh, and integrate the Ukrainian government back into the international community. Uh, that is the principal focus of our policy making. Uh, and, um, you know, while there may be some geopolitical intrigue about whether or not uh, Vladimir Putin's uh, sphere of influence is enhanced or reduced by that outcome, uh, that may be interesting uh, uh, sort of parlor conversation, uh, but it's not how this administration views uh, the dynamics that are at play in this situation. Okay. April. Josh, two topics. Um, going back to the ACA, this administration has said for months that they are expecting uh, many people, particularly young people, to sign up at the last minute. And then you tell um, Joe Johns that it's a bad, it's, there's some bad news. So what is it? I mean, are you expecting bad news, or are you expecting that they're not going to do what you thought they were going to do? Um, well, in terms of the bad news, I think I think Joe brought up some you know what um, what some some people might describe as bad news, uh, and I characterize some things that many people I think would describe as good news. Um, our projections about the uh, sign up rate of young adults uh, on under uh, the Affordable Care Act has not changed. We still do anticipate, and this is, this is informed strongly by the experience of uh, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts when they established uh, their, their health care exchange um, uh, under their health care reform law. 
what they found was that the preponderance of, of young adults uh, signed up at near the uh, end of the window. And we do, uh, we do have a similar expectation that the rate of, of, uh, of young adults who sign up uh, will increase as we reach the, as we get closer to the deadline. So you're expecting that 7 million mark to be hit by March uh, 31st? Well, I think what I said was what, what, what I expect uh, is that the rate of young people signing up for the health care plan uh, will continue to increase as we get closer to the deadline. All right, and, and last question. Um, President Obama, according to the civil rights leaders who met with him on Tuesday, mm -hmm. uh, the president did not give divulged details about uh, my brother's keeper. But will, could you tell us this, will the initiative follow along the lines that have been going on um, for the last couple of years with uh, Eric Holder as the co-chair of the initiative and more grants to be given out for um, organizations like the Urban League and the NAACP to help keep um, at-risk black males out of prison or get them jobs? I mean, what can you tell us? Mm -hmm. Uh, I certainly welcome your interest in this uh, very important issue, April, and the President does view this as an opportunity for him to exercise some authority by using the phone on his desk to mobilize people all across the country in pursuit of, uh, of this worthy goal, of making sure, of doing more to meet the needs of and support, uh, in particular, young black men in this country. Uh, we're going to have some more details about how that program is structured and what some of the commitments uh, that people all across the country have made in support of this effort. Uh, next week when the president has an event on this here at the White House. You say that he wants to do more and picking up the phone. Uh, we're hearing that it's not necessarily a call to Congress, it's a call to the private sector. Wouldn't it be more getting more done by going to Congress and getting more enacted on this effort? Well, we certainly would welcome uh, some congressional action on this, but um, there is a lot that can be done uh, in the private sector. Uh, and that there are a lot of, uh, of people uh, in communities all across the country uh, in, uh, in academia, in business, uh, other, uh, other political leaders who are concerned about this issue and bring their own resources to trying to address this problem. And again, I don't, I don't want to get ahead of, of the President's announcement, but I think um, uh, you know, the President is optimistic that we can make some progress on this, uh, and the President can make some progress on this by mobilizing people all, all across the country to take some action. So, Mike. Um, the, over the last 24 hours or so on Ukraine, the President <coughs> firm in siding with the protesters and, and putting the, the brunt of the responsibility on the government, uh, similar to the way uh, that he did in Syria over the, over the many months uh, of that conflict there. Is there any concern on the part of the administration um, that, that in the end there are some elements of the protesters that are nationalistic and that are maybe not the kinds of um, people that the United States wants to be siding with. Or it's always that kind of dilemma similar to some of the, some of the issues that have played out in Syria as well. Is, is that being talked about? Yeah. Well, uh, th they're obviously two very different situations, but uh, you're right that, the, th that again, the, the situation on the ground in, in Kyiv and in some other cities in Ukraine is uh, chaotic uh, and violent. And so in some cases it is difficult to determine uh, who is responsible for what specific action. Uh, but what is undeniably true, uh, and this has been an operating principle for some time in terms of our dealings with Ukraine, is that the, that the government does have the principal responsibility for restoring peace um, and ensuring that violence is not perpetrated against peaceful protesters. Uh, it's also apparent uh, that, that in so, at least in some situations, that that has not happened. Uh, and that is uh, why you saw the State Department put this uh, visa ban in place. And it's why the president is considering a range of other options. But we've, al we've also been just as clear that just because the government has the principal responsibility to keep the peace, it does not absolve protesters from their responsibility to exercise their right uh, of assembly in a peaceful manner. Thanks, Josh. Okay. We'll do a couple more here. Roger. Thank you. <coughs> um, change CPI again. Okay. Uh, the CBO reported that that would raise about $163 billion over 10 years. Uh, since that's not going to be in the budget now, will you be proposing some alternative for that? Uh, well, Roger, I, I, uh, there will be an opportunity for you to pour over the details of the budget when we release the budget uh, and all the at attendant indexes and charts and tables that go along with it in a couple of weeks. Um, but 
you know, I made reference to the fact earlier that there are already a number of things that, a uh, number of policies that have been in place that have sub substantially reduced the deficit. Uh, the deficit uh, is coming down at a rate now that is faster than at any time since the end of World War II. Um, you know, I mentioned the statistic that what the budget will show is that at the end of the 10-year window, the, uh, the deficit as a percentage of GDP will be below 2%. Um, you know, the previous target for this was trying to get the deficit, the, this percentage, below 3%. Uh, there are a number of reasons for that. One important reason for that is we've had enjoyed some success in reducing health care costs. Uh, at least some of that success is attributable to the Affordable Care Act. Uh, that reducing health care costs, turns out, isn't just good for the economy and good for small business owners who want to provide health insurance to their workers. It's not just good for middle class families who want to make sure that their family members can get health care. It turns out that it's actually good for the government. Who has to bear a lot of health care costs? Do an alternate. You're not going to have a substitute. Um, well, I, I'm not going to get ahead of, of where we are on the on the budget, but what the budget will show, I, I don't want to get ahead of what details may be produced in the budget. But what the budget will show is that we've made substantial progress in reducing the deficit, and it will demonstrate that the president is uh, is focusing his domestic policymaking agenda on ideas for expanding opportunity for the middle class. And one other, uh, can you confirm a report that the budget is going to increase spending by $56 billion? Well, I think what you're referring to is um, one other aspect of the budget proposal, which is that uh, the budget proposal will uh, reflect the spending levels that were agreed to in the compromise between Senator Murray and Congressman Ryan. That's on the but discretionary number, right? But well, let, me, let me finish this part of it, which is in addition to that, in addition to those uh, spending levels, those compromise spending levels that were agreed upon at the end of last year. The President will also propose an Opportunity Growth and Security Initiative. Uh, and that initiative will be a package of ideas for uh, expanding economic opportunity. Now, it's important for you to understand that the ideas, this initiative that the President will propose, will be fully paid for. It will be fully offset. It will be deficit neutral. Um, but the ideas that will be included in here are ideas that you've heard the President talk about. Um, Manufacturing hubs, fully funding the manufacturing hub program that would facilitate uh, innovation in the manufacturing industry and communities all across the country. It would uh, inject additional resources into reforming our uh, skills programs to make these uh, training pro uh, programs more job driven. It would inject funding into early childhood education programs so that uh, children all across the country would have access to high quality early childhood education. Uh, in some cases, that's pre-K programs. In other cases, that's Head Start programs. Um, but there are a range of ideas that will be included in this initiative uh, that will be fully paid for, and they will be sort of the separate module uh, from the uh, budget proposal that the President will roll out that, is, um, uh, that reflects the compromise spending levels reached by Senator Murray and Congressman Ryan. Just to clarify, you ticked off a bunch of things, the mm -hmm. hubs and the, uh, the education, things like that. Mm -hmm. Those have been all proposed in the last year's budget and some of them the year before. Is there anything new? Uh, stay tuned. Uh, we'll have some more details on, on what's included in there. I would, I would anticipate some new ideas in the budget as well. Okay. All right, we'll just do a couple more here. Scott. Thanks, Josh. Um, spheres of influence aside, what is the White House appraisal of how much influence Putin has over the Yanukovych government? Mm -hmm. Well, um, there are probably some experts in the United States government who are a little more well-versed on the history here between President Putin and, um, and President Yanukovych. Um, the, focal, the focal point of our policymaking is uh, ensuring that whoever the leader is of Ukraine, and regardless of what that person's relationship is uh, with the President of Russia, that the government of Ukraine reflects the will and aspirations uh, of the Ukrainian people. Uh, and that when, when those aspirations or when that will is not represented by the government, that there's a willingness by the government to respect that will, uh, to respect the right, the basic right of the citizens to express their opposition, uh, and to demonstrate a willingness to, peace of, you know, to, to peacefully sit across the negotiating table uh, and try to broker uh, some political agreements without resorting to violence. Uh, those are, th that's the criteria that we're looking for here. Uh, and um, so the, the question that you're asking about the relationship between Yanukovych and uh, President Yanukovych and, and President Putin uh, is uh, an interesting one and not irrelevant, uh, but it is not the focal point of our decision making at this point. But if, if your goal is a, a government that reflects the will of the Ukrainian people, isn't Putin a key part of making that happen? Uh, 
and, and, and is, wouldn't that be a focus of your engagement uh, of this crisis in general? Yeah, uh, look, uh, you know, Ukraine obviously does has a, has a relationship with their neighbor, Russia, both a historical one but also a geographic one because they're in such close proximity to one another. Uh, so again, uh, it's not a matter of that relationship, of the relationship between the president of Ukraine and the president of Russia being irrelevant. Um, but the focal point here is ensuring that the government of Ukraine uh, is, rep is uh, both respecting but also representing uh, the will of the people. And because of their failure uh, in recent months uh, to, to, to serve the will of the people, uh, we've seen a lot of conflict and strife in Ukraine. And that's why we're urging both sides to put down arms, uh, to sit down at the negotiating table, uh, and, trying to, and try to hammer out a, a political agreement here that will allow uh, the government of Ukraine and the, the country of Ukraine uh, to move forward uh, in a way that, is, uh, that better integrates them uh, into the international community. And they can do all of that uh, without there having to be a complicated assessment of, of, uh, of the geopolitical consequences for Russia, the United States, or any other country. Okay. Jared, I'm going to give you the last one. You said, Josh, earlier that chain CPI, it's still on the table. Uh, does the White House view chain CPI as worth taking up only in some kind of transaction for some uh, something out of the Republicans, or is the deficit reduction that chain CPI would give you worth doing on its own? Yeah, that's a that's a really good question. I'm glad that you asked, and here's why. This is a really important principle for the president, not just because it's good policy, but because it's simple fairness. The president is not going to be in a position where he's going to ask senior citizens and middle class families to make sacrifices in pursuit of reducing the deficit and not ask the wealthy and well-connected to make some sacrifices too. That it's just not fair and it's not good policy. So if Republicans, and Republicans thus far, have refused to even consider closing a loophole that would uh, cost uh, a, a, a corporation uh, or a wealthy individual one penny, that the second you bring up the prospect of closing tax loopholes, Republicans want to walk away. And why they think that it's good policy making to ask senior citizens and veterans and middle class families to make sacrifices, but say that corporations and wealthy individuals and well connected individuals shouldn't have to bear any of that responsibility or make any of those sacrifices, it doesn't make sense. It's not fair and it's not good policy. So that's why the president has insisted that if we're going to ask seniors and others to make sacrifices by changing entitlement programs, then we're also going to ask corporations and well-connected individuals to give up some of their tax loopholes. So you're saying that chain CPI, while it would <coughs> reduce the deficit, either doesn't do it enough or doesn't do it in a significant way that would make it worth doing on its own? Uh, I'm saying that it would not be fair to just ask seniors to make a sacrifice in support of reducing the deficit without also asking the wealthy and well-connected to give up some of their tax loopholes. That's, that, is a, that is an important principle. It's a principle of fairness. It's also a principle of good policy. So if, if Republicans hearing this exchange are thinking to themselves, well, you know what, That's a, that makes a lot of sense. Maybe I should call the White House and say, hey, look, uh, I'm willing to close some, some tax loopholes if you're willing to put some entitlement reform changes on the table. Then I would encourage those, uh, those Republicans to call the White House right now. I'm sure we can set up a meeting and we can have a conversation about that. But that offer has been on the table for more than a year and we've not seen any constructive engagement from the other side. Now, I, I, I'm not really sure why that is. Is that because Republicans are interested in uh, you know, protecting the tax benefits uh, enjoyed by the people who are funding their campaigns? Is it because Republicans have a philosophical objection to entitlement programs? Um, you'd have to ask them why this isn't a reasonable proposal, but the President thinks that it is a common sense proposal. Uh, people all across the country think uh, that this approach to reducing our deficit makes a lot of sense. We just haven't seen a willingness uh, from the other side uh, to engage in a constructive conversation about that. But again, uh, if the fact of this conversation is going to change that and uh, and cause more Republicans to reconsider their position, then, uh, then uh, you know, we're standing by and ready to have that conversation. Okay? Thanks, everybody.